I chose to begin in Exodus chapter 19 because it's really the prologue moving into Moses going up the mountain and, and receiving the tablets of stone where they're etched the commands on there from the finger of God. But it started at the beginning of this 19th chapter. Beginning in verse 1, Listen to what it says. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and they pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. Moses went up to God, and unto the Lord, and, and, and the Lord called out to him on the mountain, saying, Thou shalt... Thus, sorry, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you out to myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, somebody say, obey my voice. The church still has to obey God today. If you'll obey my voice, keep my covenant. You know what that means? Keep daily relationship with Him. He said, we've lost that in church. Some of our relationship is from Sunday to Sunday with God. <clears throat> and all you, if all you have is a weekly relationship with God, you might only get weekly blessings from God. <clears throat> you'll keep my covenant, then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is where Peter quotes, if you remember in Peter. You'll be peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Speaking of us, the church. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And then you jump over to Exodus 20 and God would chisel the stones. And here's the very first one in verse 3. Remember, this is what God was told. He told Moses, tell the people this. Here's what he says, very first one, and this is where we're going to focus on today. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The American church finds itself in a peculiar place right now. We have the opportunity to see the power of God move through us in a way which we haven't in a long time with the things that are going on in our nation. Yet the church has departed from the basic principles of the Bible. Yes, I said that. The church has departed from the basic principles of the Bible. We've allowed teachings to enter into the church even where the world still looks at the Vatican as the lead church of the world, unfortunately. The Pope there has determined that now the God of, of the Muslim is the same God Jehovah. That's his decree. Put it out to the world that it's the same God. Not only him, but now the Christian faith in our nation believes that all these other people that use the name of Jesus, no matter if they're, listen, no matter if they're using the Book of Mormon, no matter if they're using any other books or references from somewhere else, maybe the Watchtower Bible. Just because it has Bible or Jesus does not mean that it's about the one true God. And so you got to understand that God still means what He said and He meant what He said when He wrote this on the tablets of stone, that thou shalt have no other gods before Me. And so today I want to minister on what God says about this. And I'm over these Ten Commandments, I'm also going to bring them with the Lord's help as He's revealing some things as I'm studying these. Bring them to where they're applicable to you and I today. Because it's important. You've got people removing the Ten Commandments all over this country. And as they remove them, I believe we should build them and we should focus on them and make it our emphasis to make sure that the church understands what God said when He said these. The law of God's not dead. The law of God's not dead, people. It's still alive. I'm going to connect it for you. In just a moment. So this morning I'm going to title this real simply over the next few weeks, The Ten Commandments. And if you need any part of this, I'm sure they'll break them up. Part one, two, three, all that good stuff. But uh, The Ten Commandments. Bow your head with me. Father, I ask you now to anoint me. Anoint my lips right now, God. And I'm asking that your spirit would flow through me today. And now allow me to preach and teach where necessary. And let the work of God be accomplished through the preaching of the Word. You said you would display signs and wonders. After you preached, God. And so I'm asking today that after we sow the Word of God, that you would richly bless it by signs and wonders following. Touch your people today, whether they're in this building. Maybe it's the church that's been joining us online. I ask you that the Word would come clearly to them as well today. And that they would be able to make decisions in their own hearts and share these words with others. 
And more than anything else, God, we ask that You're glorified in our lives, through our lives, and by everything that we do. Let it be done for Your name. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. The Ten Commandments. Now, how many of you know that the Ten Commandments aren't the only expectations God has for us? Right? Amen? Some people think, well, <clears throat> the Ten Commandments are just the only ten things that God cares about. And if you really start studying, and that's what we're going to do when we go through these, the Ten Commandments really cover everything in a person's life. It covers every aspect. It's a big, wide, general net that God can cast to put out there. And, say, and literally, when you go through these, they bring everything in humanity into these ten things. Jesus, as you heard the last two weeks, put them into two commands. The first, He said, was to love the Lord thy God with all what? Your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength, right? And He said to love who? Your neighbor as ourselves. Neighbors being neighbors, people that are outside of the church, whether they're family or friend. Brothers, which is people inside the church, family or friend. Enemies, not that you have declared your enemy, because we're not allowed to do that. We can't render evil for evil according to what the Word of God says. So people that have declared their self your enemy, you're to love them as yourself as well. That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. But as we get into these Ten Commandments, you get a lot of discussion in the modern church today. I know what Scripture teaches about the Old Testament law and the New Covenant under Christ's blood. And I want to clarify that this morning. I'm not ashamed or afraid to preach this true Gospel the way it is. And I'm really fed up and tired I don't know how any other way to say that, with a lot of these new modern teachers, even in the Assemblies of God, that tell people, because Jesus came and died, we can do whatever we want. It's ridiculous. And, and it's not what God expected. In fact, like you've heard me state numerous times in these, t these sermons that I've been preaching lately, that when Jesus fulfilled the law, it did not nullify the law or get rid of it. And so I want to show you in Scripture where it says these things, because there's a lot of terminology in the New Covenant that Paul utilizes. It's like we're not under law anymore, right? But you have to understand what he's talking about. When he says we're not under law, people need to define, don't just use the general term, people need to know what laws of God exist in Scripture. Is he talking about the law of sin and death? The wages of sin is death. Is he talking about the law of the mind in Romans? Is he talking about the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus? What law is he talking about? But since they see the word law, they connect that to everything that God had. And so today they think, well, since it says we're not under law, we can do whatever we want to. That's not what God's expectation is. Listen, I'm not giving you permission to go live your life in sin. But if you just think that God doesn't expect you to live a certain way, go do it and see what the outcome is. You're going to find yourself lost and away from God over a period of time. But more than that even, the consequences of your sin will visit you. And then things will begin to destroy your life in your mind, in your spirit, in your physical life. There's no way that God's intention was ever to bring His Son to die so we could just do whatever we wanted to. So... Does grace then, preacher, include a structure of laws? Absolutely. God's standard and moral requirements never change. Hebrews says this of Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, that's talking about Jesus. Well, let me connect it to you then, smarty pants. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Later on, the Word became Flesh and dwelt among us. So guess what? Ha, 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 ha. Jesus is the Word and we can't depart from this. So His standard never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His moral obligation of mankind never changed. When He said thou shalt not, that's what He meant. When He said thou shalt, that's what He meant. And it's still in order today. And I've said this before, and we're going to go through these Ten Commandments. Not all of them today, thank God. But, but we're going to cover all of these over the next few weeks. And here's the thing. If, if, if Jesus did away, think about how this would be. If Jesus did away with the moral law, think of how crazy the church would be. Because that would mean men and women would be able to determine what they think is right or wrong. I see in the book of Judges there was a time like that where it says that man did what he thought was right in his own heart. God could not... You know why the Judges existed? Because man's heart was so far from God in that condition you just heard. 
that God could not even send a prophet. He couldn't even send a prophet because their hearts were so far from where he was. That's why that entire book exists. Man was leading and directing their selves based off of, listen, their desires instead of the moral compass of God. In the Old Testament, the moral compass of God was the law. In the New Testament, the moral compass of God is the Holy Spirit, which I'm going to show you, watch this. He writes the same laws in our hearts instead of on stone. Scripturally, I'm going to show you. So, does God's standard and moral requirement change? Never. What changed when Jesus came was how that moral standard was carried out in our life. That's what changes. Instead of going to an altar with an animal sacrifice and expecting that God's going to cover my sin because of this and He'll just keep it covered until the Redeemer comes one day, the method changes. And so in the Old Testament, before Christ, man did everything they could to keep the law And they couldn't even keep the law completely because everything they did ended with a sacrifice. That meant that there was nothing they did that was good. There was nothing that they could present God that was good. And we've got to understand that today as men and women. Even if we've served God for 50 years or 5 years or 5 days, there's nothing that you or I can bring to God that God sees as good or holy. It's got to be done by and through the Holy Spirit in our lives in order for it to be pure, good, or holy. And so in the New Testament, the method changed. Instead of man bringing something to God, God brought something to man, and then God found a way to live inside of holy man, or unholy man, and the Holy Spirit will flow in and through us. It's what Paul called the fruit of the Spirit. This is the Gospel. It's a simple truth. The method is what changed, not the moral standards. I mean, what moral standard could we change? We can commit adultery now because Jesus died. We can covet things in this life because Jesus died. We can have other gods because Jesus died. How foolish does that sound? Yet the church has embraced so many things today. Well, I think we can drink in in moderation. Who gets to choose moderation? Listen. Listen. There is no such thing as a moderate sin. A sin is a sin. Period. No such thing as a moderate sin. Well, preacher, what about if I have a little bit of this? Or what if I did or Jesus drank? Do you really think Jesus drank alcohol, you dummies? Not you, those on the camera. Let me clarify that. Come on, are you serious? He didn't come to get people drunk. He came to set people free. That's what He came for. It's crazy what's going on today. And even today, ministers and Christians, and I know I'm about to make some people mad, but maybe I need to today. Maybe the church will wake up if they get angry. I don't know. But now today, I can't tell the difference between a minister and a biker. The unsaved bikers, Charles. Listen, listen. A minister will have holes in his ears as big as the world. They'll have ink all over their body. Do you know scripturally? scripturally, read your Bible, people, scripturally, the child of God is told not to tattoo their bodies. Well, that's the law. We're still got moral obligations and requirements, people. Well, you just don't know what that's about. Look at me very quick. I want everybody to look at me. I wasn't always in a pulpit and in church. I was 23 years old when I got saved. And my wife will say amen that I got saved, right? But listen, I ran the streets and I was in the biggest gang the world ever had called the Marine Corps. Some of you will get that later. Look at me. I got tattoos. Oh, preacher. Before. Before. Come on, before I met Jesus Christ. Do you know that the Holy Spirit, as soon as I got saved, would deal with me so bad about tattoos? I mean, it's probably a surprise to you guys, but I like basketball. And I can remember when I first got saved, I'd go play basketball at the church we were at, and I'd go in there, and at first I'd have cut off shirts. And God started dealing with me. It's like, Josh, how are you going to prove to these people that you're saved if you still look like them? I was like, man, i got to do something about this. I need to get them taken off. Talk to my wife. Hey, let's figure out how we get this stuff taken off. And God started dealing with me then. He said, no, don't get them taken off. 
Don't let anyone else see them, but you're going to see them and remember where I brought you from every time you see them. You know what I didn't do? I didn't go get a big Jesus tattoo on my chest after that to try to show everybody I got saved. There's a moral law that's involved with the child of God. Could it be that the, the church is in such disarray today because the world has no idea or concept what God wants because the church doesn't know what God wants? And here's what I think. The church knows what God wants, but they refuse to live it because they want to look like everybody else. We want a Christianity without persecution in this nation. So therefore, you know, we got it easy. Pastor Joseph said it earlier, we live good in this country. But what the church has decided in all the freedom that we've been given in this nation, we've decided we want a Christianity without persecution. So I'll do everything they do so I don't have to look different or act different. I'm telling you, I'm going to lose supporters today. I, I'm promising you I will. Uh, not in here, but online. I, I, we get the letters. I'm telling you, they're, they're angry. They're probably already spitting fire at the cameras. But it is what it is. The gospel is the gospel. It's not just the tattoos or the alcohol. What about your lying? What about the things that you do when you cheat your employer? You cheat the IRS. It's not just one or two things that we're magnifying. I'm not even going to stand on this pulpit and say that homosexuality is the greatest sin. They're all sin across the book, and Jesus died for them all. Let's quit trying to figure out which one's worse and look at Jesus paying the price for all of them. So Jesus didn't remove the moral standard through His death and resurrection. If anything, He validated the standard. He fulfilled it. He walked a sinless life. You're going to hear that tonight. You've got to be here. It's so important to what we believe that He never committed a sin. You're going to hear why tonight. But He never committed a sin. Oh, they'll teach you today, and I don't want to get too far off into this because I'll get off of this, but they'll teach you, oh, Jesus wouldn't have committed a sin like me and you. That's rubbish. Why, would he, why was He tempted by the devil? If he wasn't going to commit a sin. Do you not think that he wasn't just tempted the one time? Because the Bible says in there, I showed it to you on Wednesday night, if you was here for the Bible study on the armor of God, where we're dealing with the Word of the Lord as the sword of the Spirit. It says in there that the devil left him for a season. If the Son of God was tempted, then the Son of God surely could have sinned, although he didn't, thank God. Thank God. But listen to this, because I want to show you this, because as we learn, here's, these are the keys to this. As we learn what God's Word says, and we see His expectation, we get overwhelmed realizing we can't fulfill it. There's nothing we can do to carry this out. So we're dependent on the Holy Spirit who is God coming to live inside of us, and He will begin as we maintain, this is the key, as we maintain, keep my covenant, like we heard a moment ago, maintain proper relationship with our Heavenly Father on a daily basis, then the Holy Spirit has access to continue to flow in and through us every day. You still here? Let me prove this to you. 2 Corinthians 3 and 3. For as much as we are manifestly, or Paul is speaking to the church there at Corinth, as you are manifestly declared to be, to, be, to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, not written with ink, but listen to this, written with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the what? Let me clarify what he's saying, and then I want to show you the next part of this. He's saying the law that God wrote a long time ago when Moses was handed to them at Mount Sinai. Does it say anything about it being gone right here? He says that the same finger that wrote it on chiseled or, or chiseled it in the stone is now living inside of you, the Holy Spirit, and he is writing those same laws on your heart. I mean, come on, church. Does it get any more clear? Than this right here. Second Corinthians 3, 6 through 11. Uh, you've heard me say this a lot right after this, that Jesus, if he did anything, he elevated the standard more than he did anything else. Yeah. What do you mean he elevated it, preacher? Jesus, remember what he said? He said, didn't the law, he told them old times, it says if a woman was caught in adultery or a man, that they'd be stoned. Jesus, or that, that you commit the act, it's done. Jesus said, I teach you this, that if you look on somebody and you think about committing adultery, it's done. That is elevation of the standard. Not lowering the standard, not removing the standard, the elevating of the standard. Well, preacher, if it was hard for them to do it then and they couldn't live it out, it's going to be much more difficult for us. Yes, again, the Holy Spirit, who is God, will live in you and He will do this for you. That's the Gospel. Listen to verse 6-11. through 11. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. 
all the preachers today take this and they say, well, it says right there the law's bad. No, connect over to Romans where Paul actually asked that question. Is the law then bad because of all these things? No, for I would not have known what God's expectation was of me if it had not been for the law. This is the key to it. You know what changed? Method, right? Method changed. So what he's saying here is the letter's the same. How it is brought about in my life is what's different. Listen to what it says. The ministration of death, written engraved in stones, was glorious. He's saying the law of God was good. It was glorious when it was on the, the, the stones of the Ten Commandments. So the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory would be done away with. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be even more glorious? For the ministration of condemnation, if it has glory, how much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed it in glory? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that is excelleth. Listen to this. For if that which is done away with, the old stones of how to bring about righteousness, if that method was done away with, how much more than that which remaineth is glorious? So the question then becomes, did God remove the Ten Commandments or did He remove the method in which they were fulfilled? We see it very clear in Scripture. So if anything did change morally, like I said, the, the standard increased or it elevated. I adhere to this thought in Christianity. God never intends for me and you to go backwards or parallel in our maturity. Did you hear me? Even the state of Texas understands that in the school system. You don't get to go to second grade every year and eventually graduate. Come on, people. You never get to go backwards and graduate. You always have to move forward and you always have to be mature. And if the natural world understands that process, why doesn't the church world understand that process? The Ten Commandments are applicable to me and you in life today. In fact, when you consider these Ten Commandments as we go over them, I thought this was interesting as I thought about this this week. If you look at every civilization all over the world, it doesn't matter what time they were on the earth. The Aztecs, the Mayans, they had laws that you couldn't murder people. Hmm. All over the world. It doesn't matter where it came from or, or, or what civilization it was. I'm not saying they're abiding by the Ten Commandments, but I will tell you this. The law of God has been written into every society on every generation on this earth. Whether or not they really knew Him or not, the, these Ten Commandments are the cornerstone and the foundation of every civilization on the planet. How they come about is the necessary thing. So what does it mean to thou shalt have no other gods before me? Let me begin by saying this. Just because it says that it's written this way here and it says thou shalt have no other gods, plural, before me, does not mean that there are other gods that can be worshipped. And it doesn't give people permission to worship anything else. It's not saying that you have to have a god and he's first, uh, ahead of the other gods. What God is saying here is there is no other gods. And this is what is very clear. What about all these other gods that are on the earth? Maybe Satan's been up to some good work. Maybe he's got some people confused. Let me show you this here as we go forward. Did you know that Israel was the only world in the nation that was monotheistic or in the whole world? Meaning they worshiped one God. They were the only one. America can't even boast that anymore. America can't even boast that we believe that there's one God. We used to, but in the last 50 to 60 years, our nation has ran from that concept. And shame on the church for allowing it to happen. But they worshipped one God and one God alone. All the nations of the world had multiple gods, as they do today, including our nation. No matter what man may come up with, or governments may come up with, or demon spirits may come up with, or angels might come up with, or that Satan might come up with, denominations might come up with it, there is only one God. I said there's only one God. How do I know? that this is a truth, that people will try to fabricate false gods. This is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8-9. through 9. Though we or an angel from heaven, look at that, even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Did you know? Listen, because the church is... and Truth is truth. I'm not even going to justify myself. By and large, the people in this nation believe that Mormonism is a Christian relief, or belief and religion. And it's not. I said it's not. 
Did you know that one of their number one belief systems, remember what it says right here, it says that if anybody comes to you, even an angel comes to you and preaches anything to you except what we preach to you, not Paul being arrogant, telling you that we preached you the truth. If anything else comes along, even an angel from heaven, and tells you something, let them be accursed. Did you know the Mormon faith is based off of an angel visiting a man named Joseph Smith? Hmm. I'm not trying to hurt people that are hearing this. I'm just telling the truth this morning. An angel came and preached another gospel besides Jesus Christ. And those people have this great looking works-based religion spread out all over the world with some of the greatest music that comes out of that choir that you could ever listen to on the earth. But Satan had pipes in him according to what the Bible says. He was the greatest singer there ever was according to what Scripture teaches about him. Yet, today people look at that and because they do good works, they think that it's okay. Works is not what this is about. We're not saved by works according to Ephesians, are we? We're saved by grace through what? Faith in whom? Jesus Christ. Come on, get me with me on this. Verse 9, he says, As we said before, and I'm saying it again, if any man preaches unto you any other gospel that you receive, let him be accursed. If a man, a minister, a preacher... Oh, pastor, you're not supposed to talk about pastors like that. Lord, help me. Jesus called false prophets and false teachers sheep that are in wolves' clothing, or wolves in sheep's clothing. He wasn't being negative or critical. He was preaching truth that there would be people sent by Satan that would stand in pulpits. And how would you identify them? You would identify them by what they spoke. So if it's not Christ, if it's not one God being the only God, and if it's not about the law of God being written on our hearts, carried out by the Holy Spirit, they're accursed. Scripture says it. They're accursed. Do you know the Apostle Paul said in the last days before the Lord comes, there'd be another Jesus preached? Boy, he's being preached right now. This smiling Jesus that you can do anything that you want to do and you're okay with God. Find your destiny. You know what your destiny is? It's hell. Did you know that's our destiny? We don't have any destiny except what Christ has given us through being born as joint heirs with Him. We have no destiny except what He gives us when we accept Him. So no, you can't find seven keys to make a positive you. You Y'all going to look that up later and know what I'm talking about. Need to throw that stuff out and start some fires down south and let people get warm from it. I can already feel the hatred through the cameras. Hallelujah. (laughs) So for anyone to believe in the one true God, we must go to the source that God provided us as a means of revealing Himself, and that's the Word of God. I'm going to say this to you. No revelation of God will ever happen in a person's life without the acceptance of the Word of God as the original source of all things. No belief in the Word. No revelation from God. No, listen, no study of the Word. No revelation from God. No daily going to the Word. No revelation from God. That's where it all begins, is the Word of God. How do you know that, preacher? Let me lay it out. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the faith, belief. Doesn't come from anywhere else. I'm sure there might be people that talk about it, but you can't lean on me for your faith. This is required of you to have faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For anyone that comes to Him must believe that He is, and He's able to. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Not my faith, your faith. For with your faith, it's impossible to please God. You must have faith for yourself. And I understand that has all different levels. But no revelation is ever going to come if you don't get in the Word and find faith. So what does the Bible say about God being the only God? There's a lot of religions around this world. There's a lot of things being accepted all over, even in the church. Does it really teach us in the Bible, the original source, that God's the only God? Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. This is interesting when you look it up because that word one Lord right there actually is Elohim in the Hebrew, which is the three forms of God, meaning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about the one God being the Godhead. Uh, Hint, hint to the other denominations out there that don't believe that. You'll get that one on your way home too. Isaiah 43, 10 through 12. What does the word say about God being the only God? You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. You, listen to this, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am, where we heard that before, I am He. 
Before me, there, listen, before me there was no God form. He is clarifying it as simple as it can get in the Word of God for anybody that would believe. Neither shall there be one after me. He ain't going nowhere. So there ain't going to be any other gods. You see this? I, verse 11, even I am, I am again the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. There's no other Savior. Did you know Christianity is the only religion in the world that teaches salvation from sin? We're the only nation. Or not nation, but we're the only religion that teaches salvation from sins. That you must repent and confess and come to God. We're the only ones. I declared, verse 12, I have saved and I have shown when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Jeremiah 10 and 10. The Lord is the true God and He is the... Is it up there? Come on, church. He is the true God and He is the living God. He's not just some spirit floating around in the sky. Sorry, hippies, He's not the trees. He's in heaven. Sitting on a throne. That's what it says. And no, we can't understand that or comprehend that in natural terms. He's got a body. The Bible talks about the arm of the Lord and the hand of the Lord and the eyes of the Lord and the ears hearing us. He's not just some mysticism or some spirit that's there. He's God in a spiritual body and He rules over everything. It says He's an everlasting King right here. His wrath, it says at His wrath the earth is going to tremble. Listen to John 17 chapter or verse 3 as Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said these words, red letter, this is life eternal. Listen to this, that they might know Thee, the only true God. The only true God. So I'm sorry for those around the world that have been taught a lie. But a lie is a lie. There's only one true God. Oh, preacher, that just sounds hateful. What about the ones that don't know? They'll be given the opportunity if the church does what it's supposed to do. If this gospel means more to you than material possession, they will hear all around the world. Y'all didn't amen that part very loud. But Jesus added something to it here in verse 3. There's only one true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So we see here that Scripture lays the platform that God is the only true God. And if you caught what the passage said before this, we see how God proves Himself to the world. It's through His exploits. He said, I'm the Savior. I have saved. I have delivered. I have shown. But the catch was that when there are no strange gods among you, you'll see my power. I get asked this a lot as a pastor. Why don't you think miracles are happening today like they used to? Could it be because we're not a monotheistic nation or church anymore? Could it be, let me just say it clearly. Could it be because America has strange gods in our nation where we used to not have strange gods and God's decree here in Scripture was I will show my exploits when there's no other gods. We're going to discuss that one pretty soon. Thou shalt not have idols or graven images. America doesn't make statues. We make green pieces of paper that says, in God we trust. It should say, in gold we trust. Even though there is none at Fort Knox. <laughs> That's another story for another time. So no religion can boast of the things that Christianity has done. No religion can boast of the things that God has done. What do you mean? He is the only Savior. He is the only Savior. Do you realize the demand of God was that man should die because of sin? For the wages of sin is... But God couldn't leave it that way. He loved me and you so much. It even says that at the beginning when our father Adam fell, that God couldn't leave it that way. He showed up right then at that moment, covered their nakedness, and then He even presented an offering Himself and taught them the way to redemption. I don't know if they saw it like Abraham did when he pulled the knife back to thrust it through his own son, and he realized, oh my goodness, I see what he wants to do. Because right before he thrust the knife into his own son, God would stop him and get this, provide a lamb. That's exactly what Scripture teaches. And so, I don't know if Adam saw it like that. I don't know if all the fathers of the faith saw it like that. But what I do know is through the generations, God made it very clear that there was no other way to get to Him on our own, that He would be the only Savior. And thank God that He chose to save us. He had every right 
to cast us to the side. But His love and His mercy endureth forever is what it says. And He would not allow mankind to stay in that terrible state. So what did God do to become a Savior? Did He give us a system of laws? No. He became a person, a man. And He laid Himself on the altar of God, the cross of Calvary. And He died for all of us. What man couldn't present, God presented by becoming a man and offering Himself. That's the Gospel. That's what it teaches. Not only is He the only Savior, He's the only Deliverer. Whenever there's a true God involved, there's liberty and freedom, never oppression. What do you mean, preachers? that mean there's never an issue? No. Israel had issues, but you know why they had issues? So God could show His power to them and the world. They were freed from Egyptian bondage. All through history in the Bible, people were delivered by God. Israel was delivered from Egypt. Canaan was delivered of all the tribes when Joshua would go in there. David was delivered from Goliath. Lot was delivered from Sodom. You look in Scripture, it's all over. Gideon delivered them of the Midianites. Samson for a time delivered them from the Philistines. We see all of this take place uh, all through Scripture. Daniel was delivered from a lion's den. The Hebrew boys were delivered... uh, from the fiery furnace. It's all through Scripture. And anyone sitting here today that believes in the one true God as deliverer has been delivered from hell, has been delivered from sin, and has been delivered from death because death cannot hold Him down. Hallelujah. He is the only healer. You know there's not another religion that preaches healing? Did you know that? And even they believe when people get sick that it's demon spirits. Other religions do. And they have their cleansing ceremonies and all this stuff and it doesn't do anything. But God is the only healer. We see in Scripture, not just when Jesus was on the earth, but even prior to that. Blind eyes have opened. Deaf ears have cleared. Lame made to walk again. Even the dead will receive back to life. He's a healer. There's no God like our God. I said there's no God like our God. He is the only provider. We're the only religion also that preaches a total dependency for all all things in the Lord. There's a lot of Christianity and sects of Christianity that go on around right now that teach and they teach that, you know, Jesus provided all or God provided everything we needed in Christ. Therefore, after He died for us, it's our responsibility now to take care of ourselves. That's not the Gospel. The Gospel is very simple. Even after you get saved, you still don't have any means in yourself as a human being to be able to do this the right way. You know what the proof is? You're going to get a glorified body one day. That means that this one must be messed up. Otherwise, it would mean we get saved and this body's okay. And it's not. There's still issues that have to be worked out and things that God wants to do. But God is our provider. We don't have to worry around, run around, try to figure things out in our life. Jesus said, take no thought of this life. He even told us that you can't worry because worrying adds no cubit to your stature. It doesn't change things. He says, bring it all to me. Cast your cares upon me. Cast your burdens upon me. That's what He told us. Is anybody hearing this today? Maybe I'm the only one that's experienced this, but He is Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Every time I've needed something, the hand of God's been open to me. Every time I go before the throne of grace, I find mercy and help in my time of trouble. That's exactly who He said He would be, and it's exactly what He's done for me every time. Listen, I've trusted Him instead of me. He is coming to get us. I said He is coming to get us. This life isn't the end. It is simply the dress rehearsal for eternity. That's what this life is. We're getting ready for that day one day. He's coming to get a church that's spotless and unblemished from this world. And He's prepared a place for us to be with Him forever. It ain't going to have seven virgins like the Muslims teach. It's not going to be a reincarnation like the Hindus teach. Who wants to come back and be a cow anyway? Think about it. We won't become, listen, we won't become gods like the Mormons teach. You better read this stuff. It's there, I'm telling you. We will not become gods like the Muslims teach, and we're not gods now like the Word of Faith teaches. That's what they teach in the Word of Faith. That you're little gods, all of us. That is so blasphemous. I don't understand where they get this stuff from. But we won't become gods or anything else. What we will be given is a glorified body. That glorified body is not going to need eyeglasses, contact lenses. It's not going to need back medication. It's not going to need Tylenol in the mornings. It's not going to be sleeping medicine at night. It's not going to have a pain or sin or anything wrong with it. We'll be just like 
Him is what the Bible says. We don't know all of it, but we're told in Scripture glimpses of what it's going to be like. I cannot wait for that day. Man, the sweet tea won't make you sick. The fried crappie won't hurt your arteries anymore. You're going to be able to walk around and be just like He was. Who else in any time frame can boast like we that believe in the one true God? Is it wrong to boast? Paul said, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the Lord. I'm happy to say that I believe in the one true God. I'm happy to say that I know Him. Not just know of Him, but I know the one true God. He has no enemy. Oh, what about the devil, Brother John? He has no enemy. Who can have the power or the wisdom or the omnipresence of God? Who can be everywhere at once, but in one person all the time? Satan can't do that. The Bible tells me in Colossians chapter 1 that at the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. It didn't happen after the resurrection. It happened when He gave up the ghost and said, it is finished. The offering was made. And it says that all powers, all principalities were spoiled in that. I'm feeling this today. Hallelujah. Listen to this. No one can stand against Him. Every nation that's ever stood against God failed miserably. Every nation. And most of the time, God didn't even use men to do it. Think about it, Jericho, greatest city they'd ever seen in all of their lives. History teaches they could line up chariots side by side and race on the tops of the walls. There wasn't just one wall, there was two walls. If you read Scripture, you find that out because the prostitutes lived in the gap between the two walls. That's what it says. That makes it even more amazing, listen, that Rahab's house was spared when the walls fell down flat. Think about that miracle. All the other houses were destroyed. All the the fornication was destroyed except one house in the midst of those two walls that had a scarlet cord hanging out saying, I believe in the God of Israel and that He will spare me if I believe in Him. And she was spared, her and her whole house. It says this, He is all things and He knows all things. He is the Lord and He is the King of glory. I say to you, church, there is no God like our God. I'm not afraid to say that today. There is no God like our God. Well, there used to be an old song they used to sing. I remember when I come up in the church, there was a song they used to sing, that there ain't nobody can do me like Jesus. I'm telling you, church, that's exactly who our God is. Our God can't compare to anyone. No one can compare to our God. He is is the one true God. Can I take a breath? So if He's the one true God, how do I get to Him? Because that seems today to be the problem of the American church. How do I get to the one true God? Let me make this very clear from the get-go. There aren't many many ways to one God. There aren't one way to many gods. That's what they're trying to teach. There's only one way to the one true God. One way. More specifically, Jesus is the only way to the one true God. John chapter 14, 6, you know this verse. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except by... Boy, that's one you need to have buried in your heart. Because that refutes every religion of the world right there. Every other means of trying to get to God, your efforts, whatever it might be, are thwarted because Jesus said, I am the only way that you'll ever get to the Father, which is in heaven. Even though it's very clear that it says that, uh, for those that still want to argue that, not in here, because you're not arguers. I know you guys are perfect. There's just glory beaming off all of you guys in here. But listen, there are people out there, believe it or not, trust me, church, there's people out there that aren't preaching this gospel no more. Churches, ministers that aren't using Christ as the platform of everything. And they tell people, if you'll do this or do this or do this or do this, even they even teach baptism and the Holy Spirit is the way to God instead of Jesus being the way to God. All right? So listen to this stuff. For those that will still not believe this, I want to lay down in Scripture. Again, I'm not an opinion man. I'm a Scripture man. That's where everything I, cut, everything I believe comes from. John 3, 16. Y'all should have this memorized. Verses 17 and 18. It's a, don't just stop at John 3, 16. Listen to this. For God so what? He loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be what? Saved. Listen to this next part. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. Here's where it gets even better. He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten 
Son. This clarifies that Jesus is the only way, the only way, to get to the Heavenly Father who is the only Father who is the only God. Right? God even confirmed it at Scripture in water baptism when Jesus was in the water. Being baptized in the Jordan River, Matthew 3 and 17, Lo, a voice came from heaven. He said, This is my beloved Son, and who I'm well pleased. Matthew 17 and 5, Jesus climbs up the, what is called the Mount of Transfiguration. His disciples climb up with Him. And it says this, While He yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye Him. So Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. I'm actually going to teach a lot deeper on this tonight. So we here, because I'm going to give you a ton of Scripture tonight. And this makes Him, since He is the Son of God, it makes Him the only salvation of mankind. Here it is from His own mouth. Jesus, red letter again. John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enters, he shall be saved. It's pretty easy. If you come in by me, you're going to get saved. Look at this. I find this peculiar in this passage. You can go in and out. Hmm. A lot of people that have walked out the gate and they've been lied to and told that they're still okay. I choose to stay behind the fence of my God. For this reason, the message in the person of Jesus Christ has been under attack all through the generations of mankind going back to the very history of Adam and Eve. Satan was promised by God in Genesis chapter 3. It's interesting that it's verse 16. That was all done by man, but I don't think it was a coincidence. But in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the orders are being handed down by God for the fall of mankind. And God tells the serpent that was standing there, who is Satan, he was using him. God looked at him and told him, you one day are going to be at enmity with her seed interesting. I'm going to teach on that tonight. A woman doesn't have a seed. That's what's interesting. But that's what God said. That her seed will come and there will be enmity between the two of you. You'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. That's what it says. The very first picture of Jesus. What theologians call proto-evangelism. It was Christ being spoken of before he was ever even on the earth. At the very beginning at the fall, Jesus was put into the story. Satan heard that. He hated that. That one day his head was going to get crushed. That meant his revolt was going to go bad. His revolution was going to go away. His rebellion was never going to succeed. And so all through time, listen, get this, Satan's not all-knowing like God. Did you hear me? He's not all-knowing like God. He has access to the Word of God, but he didn't have it back then. He's not all-knowing. He's not like the Lord is. And so he only knew what was revealed to him at times. He was told there would be a baby that would come along at some time. He knew that there was going to be a Redeemer that would come through Israel at some time and that He would defeat Him. So what did Satan determine? I'm going to get rid of this Jesus thing one way or another. What happened? The race of the giants was his very first attempt. What do you mean the race of the giants? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible tells us that the fallen angels with Satan bred with the women on the earth. And there was a race called giants on the earth. It infuriated God. It was Satan's way of trying to eliminate the human race because in eliminating the human race, he eliminated the seed, the promise. And just like, listen, just like, I probably shouldn't even say this, but it's just in my mind, so I'm going to. Just like Dallas next week is going to destroy the giants. God destroyed the giants on the earth. He destroyed them in that day when the flood came, but even later on, he would use teenage boys and his mighty men to go out and destroy the race of the giants once and for all. Because there was more than one Goliath. He had brothers. Very possible that's why David grabbed five smooth stones instead of just one. Holy Ghost don't miss. He picked up four other ones for a reason. And so there were, he had brothers, Goliath, it says in Scripture. In Ishmael, or in Abraham's day, it was Ishmael. The man of God would produce his own promise instead of the promise of God. And today, Ishmael's tribe still plagues Israel. He created the Arabs. From the Arabs would come Muhammad. From Muhammad would come the Muslims. Ishmael was not Muslim. You heard me just give the lineage. But that's where it came from. Joseph in his day was sold into Egypt. Why do you think so? Because Satan was trying to eliminate Jacob's line. He knew what was going to happen. It was the slaughter of babies in the day of Moses. Remember that? Pharaoh took all the babies the age of Moses because Pharaoh heard there was a king that was going to be a savior. And he threw them all into the Nile River except one who was spared by his mother 
who had faith and she built a little ark and she pushed him up the Nile River and Pharaoh's daughter saw the baby and raised him as her own. Well, that backfired, didn't it? It was the slaughter of babies, not just in Moses' day, but, but uh, also in Jesus' day. Remember that? Herod heard there was, gonna, there was a king born on the earth and he said, kill every baby that age. That's why Jesus and Mary and Joseph went to Egypt. And that's where Jesus got His training in Scripture as He learned the Word of God while He was absent until He was 30 years old. They were exiled into Babylon and exiled into Persia because Satan attempted to wipe the race of the Jews out. It was Hitler in the 1940s. But Jesus had already came. See, there's still more that Israel has to do. The Bible says in the tribulation that Israel is going to awaken finally. And that they're going to evangelize the entire world. Yeah. Satan has access to that Bible. He can read it today. He sees what it says. He just didn't know when it's going to be. Right. And so he's attempted to eliminate not just the Jews so they can't preach Christ, but the origin of the Jesus or the origin of the Redeemer so nobody can claim who he was. The Seven Day War of 1967 attempted to do it. And in six days, God wiped out every nation that stood against Israel. The religions of the world have tried to wipe out Jesus Christ and it's been ineffective. And today in the church, you've heard me say this, but again, it's the removal of Christ as the focal point of all things. That is Satan's work to stand in opposition of the Word of God, the will of God, and the work of God. That is Satan operating in a church. Society even beeps the name of Jesus out of movies and television shows. And they let other filthy words come through. I don't understand that, but I know what it is. It's our adversary trying to remove the name of Jesus out of every equation or every area that he can. Because if no Jesus is preached, no salvation comes. If no salvation comes, there's no healing, no deliverance, nothing else can happen in a person's life. Why would there be such an attempt to do this? I just told you Acts 4. Listen to verse 12. There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. Jesus is the only way to get to the one true God. Last thing I want to tell you, and I'm going to close with this. Let's not worry about an altar cover. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. A lot of people look at what's going on on the earth today and they get so down and upset and they wonder. Even Christians wonder, is Jesus really who He said He was? When he died on the cross and resurrected, did he really accomplish what he said? I understand we have to get it by faith. But God doesn't even leave it just to that. If you'll just get into the Word, he'll use revelation to you. Not just because it's the book of Revelation, but he'll bring revelation to you and insight and illumination of Scripture. And he'll reveal to you the very truths right in front of your very eyes that Jesus is who he said he was. Listen to this, verses 1 through 7. And I saw the, at the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a book, written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? Who, should, who can loosen the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in the earth, neither under the earth, speaking about in hell, was able to open the book, neither to look even on the book, and I wept much, John the Revelator here, he's weeping, because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither even to look on the book. One of the elders then said unto me, Do not weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Listen, it gets better. And behold, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain. Oh, was that Jesus? Remember the proclamation of John the Baptist. Jesus comes walking up the beach, and He stops everybody in the midst of Him baptizing, and He says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It was Him that we see in heaven. And it says that the Lamb of God, as He had been slain, showing a crucified Christ, off of the cross, Catholic Church, and He's now in heaven, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And He came, He took the book out of the right hand of Him who's set up on the throne. 
This tells us that he accomplished what he set out to accomplish. He finished his work just as he uttered those last three words, the most important words in human history. It is finished. We see it right here. Christ fulfilled his ministerial obligation before God, and nobody on the earth in heaven could take the book from God and continue the plan except Christ, the Lamb of God, which was slain from the foundations of the world, walked across heaven with His completed task, and He saved all of humanity that would believe. He is the one true God. Christ is the only way to get to Him. And apart from Him, there is no other. Well, there's no God like our God. I said there's no God. Like our God, would y'all stand with me today? I have preached myself out of it. Hallelujah. I want everybody here to know how much God loves you. That phrase has been minimized to about nothing today. How much does God love you? How do I know He loves you? The book of Romans says that He commendeth, or He showed, He proved His love. In this, that while we were yet still sinners... Christ died for the ungodly. That's exactly what He's done for us. That's how we know He loved us. He doesn't, he doesn't prove His love, although He extends His love through things on this earth. But don't look for the proof of God's love in your life through money, material blessing, things in your life, although He will extend those things to a believer. If you really want to know if God loves you, you've got to look to the cross. Because that's where He's magnified His love for me and you. It's where he proved it. That he would become a man. God would become a man. I'm going to deal with that in detail. How could he be fully God and fully man? I'm going to deal with that tonight. Doctrines that are important to what we believe. But he would become a man. The Bible says that he, he despised the cross. It says that in Scripture. Yet he suffered obedience, or he, he gained obedience to the things he suffered. And so he went to Calvary, and he paid the price. He now can sit at the right hand of God because of what He did for me and you. And whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How many of you believe in the one true God today? Amen. How many of you believe in the one true God today? Amen. And anybody listening today by camera wants you to know God loves you and it's not, we're not saying this in an evil way or in an ugly way. It's truth, and truth is what it is. There's only one true God, and Christ is the only way to Him. Bow your heads with me real quickly, and we'll be out of here. I can't preach about Him being the only way and Jesus being for salvation without asking you this. If there's anybody in this building that doesn't know Him as Lord and Savior, right now, I want you to lift your hand where you're at. Anybody, real quickly, because we want to pray with you to change that. If you don't know Him, but you want to get saved today, Nobody. Father, we love You and we thank You today for all that You are. That You are the one true God. That Your Son did come and fulfill what He said He was going to do. And we see right here in Scripture, He's the only one that could have done it. And it is, in fact, accomplished. Touch these people today. Help them even go out of here with this message that you're the only God. Not in a hateful or derogatory means, but with love and compassion to share with people that do not know that are deceived. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your Son. Draw us closer to you than we've ever been before and continue to help us walk with you and reflect what this says, that there are no other gods except you. Bless your people as they go out today. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hug somebody's neck before you leave today. God bless you. Be back tonight, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock prayer meeting.